Dear D, I trust this letter finds you and yours doing well. I am discovering daily the beauty and enchantment that is Paris. The sense of peace and serenity I am finding in this place has forced a realization. This is where I want to be, need to be. It is my ambition to be a successful painter. The thing I will miss most is the nearness and the opportunity to be with family, but I won't let it separate us. After all, shouldn't all children have one uncle who disappears for 20 years and returns with the beard and the scar that no one knows how he got? If you could explain to mom and dad, this is where I intend to remain and I hope they'll understand. And if you'll do that for me, I'll appreciate it. Much love, Doug. So uh, without making the early decision to stay, I knew that I didn't want to leave. And, uh, uh, but had uh, uh, initially started out as a three month visit, it turned into a lifetime. And, uh, uh, certainly without regret. It was the 1950s, post-World War II America, and life was good. Thousands of servicemen and women reaping the benefits sown by service to their country. Among them, 25-year-old Joseph Dudley Downing, whose return to post-war France marked another in a series of rebirths that would forever alter the course of his life. We came to uh, Meneb um, by chance. My friend Emmanuel and I um, had the habit of going to spend 15 days with our old, old friend, Eva Jarlot, and we'd go down and swim for 15 days every year, profit from the, from the sea. And neither of us knows how to drive. So uh, when we got to the, where, uh, the height of Meneb, um, Eva said, uh, I'm tired of lugging you two boys around. Um, there's a very beautiful little town here. We'll stop and spend the night. The next morning, I got up earlier than the other people and um, went out for a little walk in the village and followed a very, very uh, pretty little bird dog up the hill long legged and skinny, long ears. And he led me uh, past um, a tumble down looking place where a farmer was sitting in front of his house. And uh, he'd written in the top of a shoe box with a piece of chalk, ruins for sale. So I stopped to talk to him and he took me to see the ruins. And immediately, immediately I, I knew that we wanted them very, very much. They were the only thing I'd ever seen in the sun that, I could afford. The heart of it for me uh, is the studio. Two walls with windows, one wall without. I, I wrote a, a text about the room where I work. It's been my studio now for 35 years. At the rear, the village backbone, raw rock. My easel stands erect, ladder or gallows. I've kept a studio in Paris, but uh, the greater part of my work has been done uh, here in Meneb for the past uh, uh, 35 years. Window, easel, brush. There's the most silent of noises, brushes on linen. The room uh, that um, makes a central part of my life, uh, where I come every day, uh, sometimes for short periods, sometimes for, for long. In the heat, grass grows, its seeds fall, a dog barks. It's where the paintings grow. Uh, they grow up in families. And uh, like families, they have strong bonds with each other, but each takes on very early its individuality. Every day, I'm surprised to be physically and geographically, geographically where I am. It took so so many thousands of crossings of tiny little paths for, for me to be sitting here, uh, speaking in this room. Uh, 
I never felt disoriented in Minneapolis because it's so much like Horse Cave, Kentucky, where I grew up. But it was a, it was a very, a very uh, warm and delightful place to, to grow up, where freedom was the word. We were turned loose in summers, long, long, long summer days, wonderful summer days, endless summer days. Um, our minds were very taken up with thinking of the Indians who'd lived there before, and any tiny bit of flint was, of course, in our imaginations, and sometimes in reality, turned into a narrow head. We were very, very close to, uh, to, to the trees, the flowers. Life was full of discoveries. <laughs> My mother was pathologically optimistic, and uh, I have inherited that pathology. Uh, um, optimistic beyond all reason. When uh, I was six years old, my mother sent me to the cellar uh, to get potatoes. And she gave me a basket and she said, now bring back the biggest potatoes. Uh, every day, the biggest potatoes, she said, even when the biggest one is no smaller and no bigger than a marble, we'll, every day we'll eat the best. So um, uh, she um, um, passed on to me as a gift this philosophy of the biggest potato and uh, living each day for itself. And, um, and also um, um, this, uh, this totally unreasonable optimism. <laughs> Then um, came the war. I was snatched up, as were many, many tens and hundreds of thousands of other young people, and dropped into the cauldron of the war. Uh, escaped reasonably unscathed, although no one comes out entirely whole. And uh, um, that, of course, was a change of um, culture <laughs> and, <laughs> and a change of daily employment <laughs> and uh, uh, I was grateful to get through it. When I went back to, to America, um, the optometrist in our, in our local town uh, was a charming man, a very pleasant man uh, who had a sleek long car whose windows went up and down when he pushed a button. And he seemed to be doing good around him. So I thought, well, why not be an optometrist? And I decided to be an optometrist. So I went off to Chicago to do my studies, to learn to be an optometrist. And that was a, that was a, a real rebirth. So in the neighborhood of the Optometry College, uh, there was Meatpackers Row, where all the very wealthy um, meatpackers had put up palaces of one kind or another. So I went ringing doorbells from house to house asking if anyone had a, had a room to rent. And finally I rang a doorbell and this very, very lovely woman came to the door, long red hair that was wet. She just washed her hair and um, it was damp and was wearing a house coat and uh, she was rubbing her hair with a towel. And uh, um, I, I told her my mission that I needed a place to, to live. So she said, come back to dinner on Tuesday night and I'll have you a place to stay. The woman's name was Virginia Livingston and uh, she, uh, she had, un had united about 20 of the people that I would have chosen out of the whole population of Chicago. And uh, um, I was um, set loose in a, uh, in a very big and beautiful city. Uh, with its uh, joys and its dangers, uh, both of which I uh, welcomed with open arms. And um, uh, um, it, it, was, it was like uh, being born again. Uh, they led me to literature, they led me to reading, uh, and uh, mainly, most important, uh, I went to the, the Chicago Art Institute for a visit. and. Um, there, I felt that I'd had a rendezvous for all of my life. So I, was, I had this second uh, awakening, uh, or maybe first awakening, <laughs> because when I discovered painting, it was as if I'd been half asleep all my life. 
And as I said, I felt that we'd had um, uh, this meeting planned forever, the paintings and I. I, I very quickly, I, I became a painter who was studying optometry and not an optometry student who painted. Uh, I, I, as soon as I discovered the, the, the Art Institute, I learned that they gave lessons, that they, they were a school as well. And uh, for, for five years, I went uh, to, to a class with a wonderful woman named Andrine Kaufman, who taught me that you can't teach painting. Uh, she taught me that you can teach love of painting. And, uh, and did, she did that. What my family had taught me, turned me loose in the hills, uh, they taught me turning me loose in, in the museums, um, barefoot in both places, uh, uh, at least, um, if not physically, morally barefoot. And then uh, came a time uh, in Chicago when I felt myself in danger. We were all drinking too much, far too much. Um, they were off on other stimulus adventures, which frightened me. Downing's fears were calmed and his excesses derailed with the unexpected arrival of a war insurance refund from the federal government. The $300 rebate would finance a return trip to France in 1950, the pivotal journey marking perhaps the greatest rebirth in the life of Joe Downing, the painter. There, my lord, I burst open into flower one more time. A uh, wilted flower, probably. Uh, um, not a handsome flower, surely, but I flowered one more time because standing on the Pont Neuf, looking up the river and down the river, I thought, well, this is for me. This is, this is wonderful. This is, I feel right here. I feel at home here. Working in a law office by day and weaving raffia lampshades at night to make a living, Downing quickly found himself immersed in the Paris art scene of the 50s. The fledgling artist got a break, his first exhibition in Paris in 1951. The Gallery 8 showcase not only brought attention to his work, it also brought a fated encounter with the great Pablo Picasso. Uh, the, uh, the gallery had a big uh, glass window in the front, and uh, I was weaving uh, in the back of the gallery uh, on, the weep, uh, on the lampshades. And, um, a shadow fell on the floor, and I looked up, and it was Picasso peering in, peering in the window. And I'll never know ever whether his initial interest was in the lampshades that I had with me or in the paintings. But anyway, I very carefully kept my gaze down until I heard footsteps come to the center of the room, and I looked up, and there he stood. And uh, it was an extraordinary feeling, of course. Uh, I, I turned pink, I turned red, I, uh, I almost jumped up and down <laughs> uh, on the spot. And I was very careful to be discreet. And he, he looked around for a long time. And then uh, he came to speak to me. And he, um, he told me that he liked the exhibition. And he said, when your work has changed uh, sufficiently to bother me in a way, was what he was saying, um, this is my card. I'd like to bring some, I'd like for you to bring it to show me again. So um, I waited two years, and I brought small pieces for him to see. And he gave me the uh, kind of encouragement that, that uh, helps, you know. He, he uh, said, work hard. You know, be, be true to yourself. And uh, it was a marvelous experience. He was very kind. I've always felt that an artist follows his work more than he leads it, and that uh, you, have to, you have to impose a certain control and thoughtfulness, but um, I think the true path is to, is to follow the, the art and go where it leads. And sometimes it leads you on paths that are less pleasant than the ones you have been treading. And, uh, but I've learned that you must take those 
paths, otherwise you, you miss the bridges, uh, you miss the connection to the next, the next uh, development. Everything one loves gets melted and comes out finally. It's uh, one a strange source of my painting, and that they became very visible was once uh, I was sleeping at the farm that um, that was my sister's farm with with her husband, and. Uh, uh, one morning, very early in the summer, she called me. It was around six in the morning, and uh, she said, "Come, there, come look. There's something very beautiful." So uh, I went, and uh, it was a spider's web that was just being finished by the spider. But I knew that she wouldn't have called me for that because we'd seen that thousands of times. Uh, so she said, "Wait and watch." And the the spider's web had little dew drops on it, as it sure it had had, catching the light. And the spider, when it had finished the web, the architectural part, went back to the beginning on the left and uh, started weaving a transversal band that had no necessity for the strength of the web. And in this band were tiny, tiny little symbols, little letters, little figures. Uh, and my sister said, this is the secretary spider, and what she weaves is the, uh, the date of the end of the world. But uh, up until now, no one has been able to read it. And so the, um, when I saw bands of not quite distinguishable letters and figures turning up in my paintings, I knew that I had to thank my, my sister Elizabeth and the, and the spider. The big change in, in my palette was, uh, was the physical and geographical change from painting in Paris to painting in the South, painting in Provence. Um, my palette exploded. The, the, bright color, the bright colors came because I was living in the bright colors. Oh, I love dark paintings, yes. And I've done, I, I, I just a, a few months ago, did a very, very, uh, um, a painting that's very important to me that, that's very dark, in dark browns, somber reds. I, I love dark paintings, of my own and others. They, they don't occur as often, but when they do, I bless them, you know. I'm happy to see them. I'm very glad to see them. But they don't, um, communicate particularly dark sentiments. I still consider easel painting, oil painting on canvas, the, my, my gravest and, and uh, most um, interesting for me and most important engagement. But um, very quickly in paintings as intricate as mine have decided to be, um, um, very quickly the doors close in a day's work. Um, suddenly you can't advance and um, uh, I've learned that you must leave the painting then to rest a little and, until you see a way through. And uh, um, doing, working manually on um, cutting leather, um, preparing the backgrounds of leather strips to, to make a composition uh, on one of the columns, uh, nailing. The, I use little um, cobbler's tacks. They're very handsome. Uh, there are no two heads that are exactly alike. The heads aren't quite round exactly. They're sharp little tacks that turned out to be perfect for, for my use with the uh, um, painted leather on wood. Also, I've learned quickly that the fact of, of cutting canvas or leather and uh, nailing them to wood loosen me up to go back to easel painting. Someone told me of a big pair of barn doors uh, from a farm not far from the Nev that were being sold by their owner, uh, who was a healer. He laid on hands and healed. 
I called them Isidore's doors for a long time because Isidore had carved his name into them. But they, they, we've called them the, the, the gates of life. Uh -huh. And so the doors sat there for 11 years before I uh, touched them to paint on because they were so handsome in themselves that they defied uh, any embellishment. And um, I was very pleased, of course, that these doors were finding a new life. I think much of my painting is based on the yearning for, for Eden and the, uh, the knowledge of the loss of Eden. Uh, um, I think much of, of modern um, angst and, and anxiety and, and, and nostalgia are, are basically uh, the knowledge of the loss of the perfect place. I'm quite uh, willing that that be the theme of my paintings, unconsciously. But there's still little chips of Eden lying around, thank God, they, uh, that we can pick up and hold to our chests and cherish, you know. I know. Uh, it's just nice to know when you, to be able to recognize them. I've been uh, living in a chip of Eden for all these years. A big chip of Eden. But I think the only thing that any, any, uh, <coughs> any older painter could say to a younger painter, um, follow your, your instincts, uh, follow your nature, um, be uh, true to yourself. But um, it, it's uh, evident necessity. Um, follow your nature instead of other people's uh, schools or, or inventions. Uh, and work. And work. The, um, you cannot um, paint unless you're in the studio. Uh, you can't paint if you're, uh, if you have a very vigorous social life. There's no way, because water gets into the wine. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no way one can have a, a, um, a flamingly wonderful social life and then and, and work and paint. You, you have to have time not only to put uh, paint on the end of the brush and put it on the canvas, but, but time to piddle, time to, to do what the, the writers call uh, a pencil sharpening. I mean, you, uh, pencil sharpening puts you in the mood to write. And uh, so the painters have to sort of piddle around and, and look and, and uh, displace a few tubes and, and have time to do nothing. Uh, and none of this can happen unless you're physically present in the studio. But that's, um, the, 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 I don't think any other advice to be given. But um, as I get considerably older and um, um, think about tucking in the edges to make a neat departure, um, I thought it would be nice to say I will now do my last 10 big paintings. I would like them to be big. And because uh, they would be more conscious than anything I've ever done. They would be done uh, as, a, as a, a, a final paragraph. But I'm not sure that I'm there yet. Uh, I mean, maybe, they, that, maybe that was, will be still later. We'll see.